why, you know, Fairfax and, and uh, Marin County is sort of the Bible belt of, <laughs> of mountain biking. And, you know, you can have them on a couple segments. You'd be fine for like 20 minutes. You're fine. And then, yeah. um, and you want to record two shows today. If that's okay, yeah, because I'm not going to be around next that. Tuesday. And then, you know, we, I've got uh, some ideas for the second show, and, and you, you do probably too, so I think. Uh, we'll uh, just a little bit. You know, I, I've just been out of it for two weeks. And yeah, so it's okay. Trying to get my brain around. I we, we can, we can defer to you, and I'll yeah, just yeah, talk some NFL. Tag along. NFL okay. uh, training camps and baseball and dog days of August, that kind of stuff. Okay. And then at some point, you, uh, you wanted me to remind you to give Ray Ridden a call, but I think you already Oh, Ray Ridden, yeah. yeah. I, he's on vacation, so okay. I'd rather go through him than the other two PR guys. The other two PR guys are younger guys, and they're just not going to help. Yeah, and we had Bob Myers on once before. Yeah, no, he'll, he'll do it. I just think probably we'll probably get him the next time. Okay. That'd be good, because that'll be about a month away from training camp. I'm going to try to get somebody from the Raiders. Okay. Question for you. Yeah. Is um when we first started we mm -hmm. uh we recorded on Tuesdays because Burns schedule. Right. Are Wanna you do it some other days? Are you, I was gonna say if you're yeah, flexible. Yeah. Oh no, I'm flexible. I, I uh I, I don't have to do any more afternoons because they got rid of afternoon sports. The KGO, yeah. which is about twenty percent of my part time work, but I the only time I ever work there's mornings in the weekdays and mornings on the weekends. So I'm always free in the afternoons any day. Okay. What I'm thinking of is, uh -huh. because I do my business one on Thursdays, yeah, yeah. Just in general, uh -huh. um, and what this one will cover the next two weeks sure, anyway, sure. could we maybe start doing it like on Thursday yeah. at 2.30 or so? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Just remind me. Send me an email and just remind me. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. get in the habit. Yeah, that's not a problem. All right. So that would be, yeah. that would be awesome. Not okay. a problem. And then, um, I don't know if you're interested in this, mm -hmm. um, we're almost caught up with living. You guys do hornblower at all? Oh, you know, I, I, the only problem is Cle I'd love oh, to. Cleth's got that. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, never mind. But no, but that's nice. Thank okay. you, thank you for thinking of us. I, uh, she could probably figure out that. Uh, I'll, no, I'll ask her. I'll ask her. Hang on to it, and I'll ask her. Okay. You know, well, I got. I got to give it to. I got oh, to do, yeah. So okay. you know what? We'll, we'll do something. We're else. doing the um, grape leaf in next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and okay. then we're doing, and then we're doing the, the place over the resort in Spa in uh, Calistoga Excellent. the following week on Wednesday, Thursday. Good. Good, yeah, good, yeah. Good. So we're taking a little mini, mini vacation. That's part, so. part, I like those. Yeah. First thing, more no, had, I'll never even do these two week ones again. It's just. Was it a killer? It is. Yeah. I've amounted it too much and yeah. can't even get it back. Up, yeah. All right, let's get this guy a yeah, call. Yeah, yeah, us a call. He's yeah, a great guy. I like him. Hey, Otis. How's it going, Bruce? Good, good, good. You been out on the trail yet today? I know. I went for a surf this morning out of Colony. Oh, did you? Was it any good? Uh, there was a little bit of a okay. Yeah. This time of year, we're lucky if we get anything, huh? Right. Yeah. Well, it's been working okay, but, you know, it's, it's sort of thing that we're, 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 we're counting the days until September 1st. Yeah, as soon as we get into the fall, we'll get some nice swell. I've only been out maybe five times in the last month. It's been I'm getting really, I'm jonesing big time. Well, yeah, I've been busy. I got the mountain bike camp. Every yeah. time I have the mountain bike camp for kids, we have a thousand bucks. Right? <laughs> That's the way it goes. I basically screwed myself. Like, Tim's like, and when do you have the last camp next week? He goes, cool, man. It's going to be a good surf next week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, the last night, just hung up on the second of Oh, boy. <laughs> Bummer. Okay, so well, I, I tell you what, Otis, uh, what I'm going to do, because I've been kind of out of things for a couple of weeks here, I'm going to let Bruce kind of run it for a while. I'll do the introductions, uh, and then I'll let you introduce the, the sure. people. We'll just kind of take it from there and yeah. enjoy ourselves. It's very informal. Okay, our first uh, segment is only about 2 minutes and 20 seconds, and it's uh, Bruce and I basically just kind of getting talking about what we're going to be talking about. So okay. hang, out, hang out with us. You can hear the first segment, and then we'll come in. Uh, I'll save the file, and then we'll come in with a welcome back, uh, and then Bruce, please introduce our guest, okay? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Okay, so here we go. Welcome. You're listening to Sports Geek Con 101. This is the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Today's show is going to be fun because we're going to have a different kind of guest. Yeah, we're going to talk a little mountain biking, which, of course, out here on the West Coast is pretty big, but it has become a huge recreational sport nationally and is certainly 
popular with young people, but older people as well. And we've got one of the guys who's really sort of a the founder, if you want to say. Pioneer. Uh, yeah, pioneer of mountain biking. He's going to join us. Otis Guy from Marin County. So that's going to be fun. Right in our backyard. Okay. Yeah. And at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question where we're going to be giving away a vacation to the first e the first email. We used to give three away. Now oh, we're right? give one now away. Now only one. A little then. too popular okay. there. Uh, tougher tough, questions. Tougher questions. That's right. Uh, the vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by Lighthouse Resort and Marina. And the vacations are free. Their only request is a $75 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses. And check them out at uh, lighthouseresortandmarina.com. You can see where they're located. And today's trivia theme is going to be miscellaneous sports oh, questions. So bounce all over the place. Bounce huh? all over the place. Yeah, okay. let's see. Maybe even mountain biking. Maybe, uh, not this time. <laughs> we got, a, we yeah. got uh, something about uh, baseball, something about football, and something about the NBA. Oh, there you go. My yeah. three favorites. That's yeah. right. I was, I was going to keep, keep you in a, sort of in suspenders there. Yeah, please. there you go. Okay, so um, again, when we come back, uh, we're going to have Otis Guy, who is, uh, this guy, is uh, kind of a pioneer yeah. in the mountain biking industry. No it, question. It sure took off, because uh, isn't it even in the Olympics now? I, well, we're going to get Otis Guy to talk about that. We'll get Otis on here in yeah. just a little bit, and uh, okay. he'll tell us about it. So this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding still over 8% mm. secured by real estate. San Francisco Bay Area real estate is in most of the portfolio, mm -hmm. less than 60% loan to value, safe. Uh, it's, it appears to be very conservative, let's oh, put it that way. Okay. Uh, check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Now stay with us. When we come back, we're going to have Otis Guy. Uh, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial because we will be right back. Okay, okay so that's our first little uh, teaser, so to speak. We save the file and then we'll have Bruce. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what Edward and I do is he records this on um, on the computer and then just sends it down as a file to Sports Byline USA. So Sports Byline USA picks it up. They have about a, what is it, about 140 stations, Edward? Uh, I think it's just 200. Two, almost 200 stations right. nationwide. Uh, you, no, you can send me a link to some information. Yeah, 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 no problem. For our, uh, for our archive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's also on iHeartRadio. Um, and it's also on one other. Yeah, it's tune on your, in radio. Yeah, yeah it's all, all kinds. If, of if you just if you just went uh, Google Sports Econ 101 with Edward Brown, you'd find it. You'd find the web page, and yeah. then you could. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I found it on the website. I'm, uh, I downloaded a picture of what looks like you on a bike. So I'm going to use right. that. Okay. Good one for me with uh, with some stuff on the. Oh, cool. There's a, you know, a picture of me, I think, my racing on my own website on the motorcycle cycles. Okay. Website, and I've got kids pictures on, uh, I, I do about my camp with kids, and there's two in grade well, high school, whatever, I'm going to tell different things. Well, I think what, if you want to email me, edward at sportsecon101.com, uh, you know, a couple of pictures, I, I'll see which uh, one works best for the website, okay? No problem. All right. That's great. Okay. okay. And we're going to take off here. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. And Bruce, we gave uh, the audience a little teaser as to who was going to be our guest. Why don't you go into a little more detail? Yeah, it's a neighbor and a friend of mine I've known for a few years, and a fellow that uh, really is kind of responsible for much of the popularity of, of uh, mountain biking, not only in Marin County, which is really sort of the Bible belt of mountain biking, but also now it's become such a popular sport. I was up at, at Lake Tahoe recently at a, at a resort, a ski resort, which they turned into... Uh, a mountain biking haven, that's North Star. There were, you know, mountain bikers everywhere. And Otis Guy uh, has been mountain biking since I don't know when. Uh, he's, he's a former fireman, so he's a good guy. You know, firemen are, good, are the best. They're the heroes. But he also has uh, mountain biking camps for kids. And Otis, how long, have you been, uh, how long have you been out on the bicycle doing this thing? Anyway, when did you start doing it? Well, I started riding on bikes back in October 1973, but I was a, a, a road racer before that. So I raced on the road starting like, like the uh, late 60s. Wow. And then later on, so mountain biking for us was more of like an off-season diversion from road riding. Mm -hmm. And mountain biking, it's interesting, too, because back in those days, in the early 70s, it was really primitive. I mean, you had what they called the fat tires, but most of the mountain bikes were not even uh, manufactured. They were just sort of uh, cannibalized from other bikes, and you sort of put them together on your own, huh? Right. What they were, were we were riding a pre-World War II slim. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were seemed to be like the best bikes. They had a higher bottom ride, which over logs and trees and everything much easier. And back in those days, you know, there was, we had the trout years in Marin, and then there also was the trail side killer. So not many people 
The trail side killer. For those that don't know, this was a a um, a guy that was actually hiding on the trails and killing people. You know, a serial killer. It was pretty scary. Yeah, usually like, up at trailheads, he killed uh, people out of point Reyes, Santa Cruz, on Mount Camp, Slumber. Yeah. We always kind of felt like when you get past the trailhead, we were okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God they caught him and put him away. I mean, that was that was scary. That was way back in the uh, late late seventies. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, so there, you know, he found that that was a time when you know, you know, people didn't hike as much. Yeah. You know, people didn't go outdoors as much. It's so nice to see people really enjoying the outdoors and seeing how what the culture has changed as far as people exercising and enjoying the area they were in. And, oh, that's the thing. Uh, it's a lot more health conscious now. Much more health conscious, and we just have more access. So back then, the trails on Mount Cam, they had very little marking, and they were also like very narrow. So you see pictures of us, and we wouldn't be wearing cycle clothes. We'd be wearing long, long sleeve tees, long sleeve shirts, jeans, and hiking boots. Hmm. We're on these old bikes, like from the, like by the best bike the bikes we have now in the museum. A bike I one we had on a 41 Schwinn. Wow. And it had a very large gear, so so it was very for us. It was very these bikes were simple. One gear, you're never getting flat. It's not a road bike with drop bars. And I could see more I could do, much like a hike when I was a Boy Scout, I could do it like an hour and a half on the mountain bike. Because where we live on Mount Cam was like one of the most beautiful places on earth. So it was another way for us to enjoy the place where we grew up and we were really enjoying being. Now, did you say they didn't get flats? No, very, because those were big. You'll go look at the mountain bike. The mountain bikes are big tires. So in fact, we didn't even carry a spare tube or carry anything with us. It was like we're more into the purity of it just being this simple bike. And no, we didn't. Oh, wow. I don't think I actually ever, almost ever got a flat on the mountain. Well, well, how'd you get the knobby tires unless you invented <laughs> them, you know? Yeah, there was big knobby tires. And, you know, they, we knew they were kids. You know, they were meant for like uh, paper routes and stuff. But the bigger wheel bikes, 28 inch wheel bikes, did not have bigger tires. And they weren't really set up to maybe go off road. But that's an interesting thing. I, I do a lot of hiking, and I've done a little bit of mountain biking, mostly on dirt roads, but I tried, there's a, a trail in, in Marin County, and, and Marin County, for those of you listening that don't know, is just north of the Golden Gate. Otis was referring to Mount Tam, that's Mount Tamalpais, which is the big coastal mountain, about 2,500 feet tall, just north of the Golden Gate. There's some great trails up there. I tried this trail called the Tamarancho Trail, which is right in my backyard in Fairfax in central Marin, and of course, I'm not a an experienced mountain biker, and I gave up after about halfway through it. <laughs> but it's it is quite a challenge. And Otis, I guess that's just a normal a normal ride for for a yeah, lot of mountain bikers. That's, that's considered an advanced bike. Is it okay? okay. Well, that makes me feel better. Feel better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did well. That that's definitely an advanced trail. Now I do plan like your mountain bike for kids for the last like seven years. And you'll but we would we do have some very skilled kids. We even have one kid that now does a camp for like every year. Uh, even when he was like eight years old, he was making it. But remember, they're lower to the ground. And, and remember, we think when we ride, they don't think kids just react. <laughs> That's they're true. More, more confident than we are. So if you can just get them moving, they do very, very well. well boy, that is a, I, I tell you something, that is a workout, uh, especially going uphill and then, you know, bouncing over the rocks and over the tree stumps. And I mean, the uneven terrain that you're on, you really have to be on. You can't relax for, for a second when you're doing this. In a sense, yes, though, because in a, in a way, the better you do something, I'm sure baseball players tell me the same thing, they can see the ball best when they're relaxing. Part about mountain bikes is most bikes can take a lot. If you point them straight, if you find the nice line and you relax, you can make it over a lot more stuff. I think, like anything else, we're the ones who screw it up rather than the machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's kind of fun. Uh, I was in this group where we were riding, and it's just kind of doing a whole bunch of different things. Some might be hiking one day. So they wanted to do biking Phoenix Lake at night. Mm. So there's no oh, yeah. lights there, and you, ha you have to go by basically the moon. It, well, actually, if, if the moon's not there, it's kind of tough. I mean, to do it no first. headlights or anything. No, no headlamps. No. no. Yeah. So it gets a little. A wow. Little but scary. I know. I know, Otis. I think you go out on some night rides, but you guys use uh, headlamps, though, right? Oh, well, that well now that all these lights. I mean, if you're if you're, if you're somebody who wherever your area where you live, and now you see bicycle computers, these headlights they have now for bicycle computers. Lighter than a car light. Mm, no, wow. for us though, we, we wanted to make sure we didn't get caught by the rangers. Oh, right, right. Well, all the rangers usually are now. <laughs> just the rangers can see you. It's just a matter of them wanting to go up and get you. Like from where I live, where Bruce lives, you can see 
the whole this whole uh, ah. north side of Mount Cam. I can tell you almost every trail somebody's riding by the time because I can see their headlights. Well, it's, it's, it's fun. Fun. well, again, so we, we didn't have any headlights. It would have been just by noise. Mm -hmm. And the, the leader the told us. The other room, but I, I can't remember. It, 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 it's not legal to be on Mount Cam so proper during, during the night. So for safety reasons. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was this was Phoenix Lake. So, but yeah, that, probably that, still that, wasn't allowed. And the guy, the leader said, louder. "Listen, if you, if if you, Ranger wants to get you, just drop the mic and run." <laughs> <laughs> Should mention we're talking. <coughs> What's that, Otis? I'm sorry. They, now, the Drake High School, the local high school, actually has a mountain bike team. Who do you compete against, Otis? We actually, the, the team just won the state championships this year. Wow. We, we get down in Southern California. There were 120. Whoa, 122 throughout the state. Throughout the state. So, I mean, for, for, for people like Joe Breeze and myself and Mark Mendetti, it's, you know, see, in a sense, we saw these bikes first. This is something we enjoy to hear. We, we were in, but also, we saw these bikes, we like the transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and a way to enjoy the outside, but also, most people don't want to be on drop bars and skinny tires and flat. You know, so, it was great for going off road, but also for the bikes for transportation. So for us to see to start doing this thing as you know, uh, you know, young kids in 1973 to see it grow to the point where now it's this high school mountain bike racing, and I'm actually a coach of a high school mountain bike team. Who would have thought, you know, somebody with a skinny little kid in high school would like sport with cycling, would ever you know, find a way to coach a sport and actually have a team you know, go that far. Yeah. And, wow. and I'm sure you've seen uh, uh, changes in the bikes quite a bit. Well, absolutely. And so, that was a big part. We were the... We, Started a race team, so the National Off Road Bicycle Association. And one of the big things was we didn't want to make it like road bikes. If you got a flat, somebody gave you another wheel. We wanted people to be self supported. So, in other words, the bikes would not become you know, uh, bikes that would fall apart. We would give the support for racing, make bicycles better for the masses. Got it. Hey, Otis, stay with us. We got to cut to a commercial break here. Okay, so here we go. The uh, theme is just miscellaneous trivia. This one's a baseball question. Who was the first person to have his number retired by a Major League Baseball team? Mm, all right. Good question. The uh, first, we're just going to do the first email with the correct answer wins a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to this question. Who was the first person to have his number retired by a Major League Baseball team? Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101 with Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan. And our guest, pioneer, mountain biker, or mountain bike pioneer, Otis Guy. Stay with us. I'm, I'm going to guess uh, it had to be Babe Ruth. Well, no, you'll, I'll give, you'll I'll give guess Otis on a the chance air. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you know a guy named Pat Seidler? Yes, I know Patrick Seidler very well. Okay, you know, it's interesting because Pat uh, used to share office space with me back in the early 90s. Before he, I think, got involved with a uh, with, with trail bike. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, interesting. But I, I haven't Pat, seen him for quite a while. Done a tremendous amount of that advocacy work, you know, uh, for, for mountain biking and for cycling. So he's done a very good job. Okay. Oh, is there anything in, in uh, specifically that you want to mention or get into that uh, we haven't discussed? Like, I don't want to. Uh, I, I I would love to mention the friendly scene of bike. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Definitely. Let's get into that. That'll be fun. And then also you talked about you know when the, the first Olympics were in 1996 and actually a, a local girl Susan Decay okay from the county got the bronze medal the first time mountain biking was in the Olympics. Wait, wait, you said you say Sue Decay? Susan Decay, yeah, the local uh, went to Paralympics. I I went to school with her. Yeah, so you might know Nancy and everybody. Yeah, else. that's yeah. I didn't know that Sue did that. Holy wow. smokes! She's phenomenal. I've I've ridden I've raced and ridden thousands of miles. Wow. That's so you said, yes, you know, if you know her, she's one of the nicest folks. Very, very yeah. nice. Oh, does you great family? You know, yeah, they're they're all nice. Okay, they're all nice. Wow, Good deal. I didn't all right. Okay. okay, here we go. You ready? Okay. 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 Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we kept to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question: Who was the first person to have his number retired by a Major League Baseball team? Well, I'm going to ask him this guy if he knows, but I'm going to throw my, my answer out, too. I'm going to say Babe Ruth, just a, as a wild guess, because, you know, that before the 1920s, uh, baseball players didn't wear numbers. Ty Cobb, Christy Mathewson, yep. uh, Walter Johnson, none of those guys had numbers. So, Otis, any idea? 
I feel Lou Gehrig. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Lou Gehrig. Very good. Very good. You got it. Yeah. Like, I love it. Yeah. And it's, prob- it's probably because, you know, 1939, he yeah. you know, his last year and all that kind of the stuff. The luckiest man in the base. How about that, Otis? Man, you, you beat me, buddy. Boy, the mountain biker. Yeah. Not <laughs> like he is baseball. Who says, who says you don't know about the other stuff? You know, it's funny about the numbers. If I remember correctly, the reason, and I don't know if it was Kennesaw, um, Mountain Landis, Landis yeah. you know, had said, hey, we want numbers on these guys because that's the batting order. Yeah, well, part, part, part of it was that, and, and Babe Ruth was the three hitter, and uh, you know, Lou Gehrig, I believe, wore number four. Yeah, there's four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and DiMaggio was number five, but yeah. The thing is, what happens when a coach, a manager, wants to change the line? I know. Well, I think that was done originally <laughs> that way, and then they just changed it up. You know, I always, my favorite number is always. If you got a mouth like that, you came up with the right answer. There you yeah, go. There you yeah, go. you know your stuff. Your favorite number is 24. Well, I was going to say 24, Willie Mays. Yeah. Yeah. And Otis is not that much younger than me, so he he grew up with Willie Mays, too. Well, Otis. Yeah, no, he lived in my neighborhood for a little while. There's really? Dominican. No, I remember getting a signed baseball from him. Or something down near Montefield Shopping Center way back. Is that right? Huh. Wow. Boy, you know, Otis Guy is our guest. Otis is a pioneer of mountain biking. Uh, he, he still races to this day and holds camps here in Marin County, north of San Francisco. And Otis wanted to get a plug in for something that we find very special in the little town where I live in central Marin County, Fairfax. And that is that there is now a mountain biking museum right on the main drag on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Tell us a little bit about that because that just opened up this summer. It just, we just opened up this unit called the Marin of bicycling, which houses the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame, international organization, which has been going uh, since 1988. And I was inducted into the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame in 1993. And what we have there, we have bicycles from the 1860s to modern times. Wow. Not just mountain bikes, but we have like, you know, the first of show that was one of the first pedal bicycles ever made. Um, we have my high wheeler there. Oh, yeah. We have this beautiful collection of bikes, most representative of the 18th. 70s, 1890s, and 80s, zeros, and then we have bikes that go up from there, including mountain bikes and road bikes. It's a beautiful 3,000 square foot uh, space, and this was kind of a dream of the old days of my soul. Way back when we saw this Ziegler collection, this was the old bikes, back at this, at this man's house, David Ziegler, back in like 1973 or 74. We always kind of kept track of these bikes, and he passed away, and his son had the collection, his son's bike passed away, and this is what we have this. Beautiful space that really tells the story of, of cycling and mountain. Well, if I'm not mistaken, for those who were uh, listening, the high wheel—that's the one you kind of see in the you know, like the old 1800 uh, you know, movies yeah, and, and stuff. The reason, the reason that was like the show, they had the pedals were connected to the, to the front wheel, mm-hmm. which was which was a large wheel and a small one in the back, right? Right. Well, that was just there, both the same size wheel, you did pedal, but very. If you ever hear the term like that, I, I'm riding a. a I'll start an 80 inch beer on a bicycle. That, that seems called like the high wheel, like my high wheel is a 52 inch wheel. So, one revolution of the pedals, that wheel of 52 moves two inches. Ooh. That's where the inches come from. But that bike didn't show at a 28 inch front wheel. So, I think like one pedal stroke moves you like basically you know, less than a stride. You were not, you were probably going like six miles an hour. Well, wait, wait, what's, what's the one where it's uh, the huge wheel in the front? And then that's the high that would be the, that is a high wheel. High wheel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what Interesting. I thought. Well, the reason that was because they didn't have gears yet to change. Mm-hmm. That hadn't been invented yet. So the only way they could figure was to get a bigger gear and to make a large wheel. And so that was the first. That was, so I would have been great. I'm, I'm like 6'6". Six, six. I would have been like a big star <laughs> if I lived in the wrong time because I would have had one of the largest wheels you could get because my legs were long enough to fit over yeah, because that's a hard, that's actually I, I had a friend who had one, but I never got to ride it. it it's kind of a little challenging, isn't it? Oh, it's very challenging. You don't realize how low the trees are in your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you get knocked off one of those trees. It's quite challenging, oh. and, and if you think there's like a man named Thomas Edison that rode around the world on a high wheel. Really? This guy was going he was going across the U.S. He was chased by Native Americans. You know, uh, which got away from him. He was going over train trestle when a train came. He hung off with one arm with a bike that probably weighs like 60 pounds with his pack while the train rumbled over the tracks. Jeez. So like, if, if you want to talk about, like, you know, mixed martial arts or tragedies, I think Thomas Stevens may go down in history as one of the toughest guys ever. Wow. <laughs> wow. Hey, speaking that of. That was all on a high wheel. And remember, those were wow. They were just, you know, basically wagon wheels. Oh, yeah. 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 And this, you know, the big wheel and the ball, the weight, and Thomas Stevens. Yeah. Hey, you know what we 
got you on the topic of mountain biking, i got to ask you, about it, it's now an Olympic sport, and it has been for, what, 20 years almost? Since 1996 was the first wow. Olympics that was in Atlanta Olympics, and we actually had a local woman, Susan D. McKay, that won a, a bronze medal at those first Olympics. Wow, and Edward Edward actually knows her, and went, did you go to high school with her? high school with her, wow. I didn't realize that. She, uh, yeah, she went to the the high school, she said the very same day, Reeves, who's actually the designer of that 1996 course. Wow. Wow. Um, I stayed with them when I was inducted in the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame when it was in Crest, Colorado. So then, and that was that would have been the Atlanta Olympics, right? Right. That was the Atlanta yeah. Atlanta Olympics, yeah. That, that, that poor guy was uh, the inductee. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny, Otis, whenever I think of Otis, I always think of surfing, because Otis is a board surfer, I'm a body surfer, but we always talk surfing, and I know that's a passion that's near and dear to you, but then at the same time, you're really much more renowned for your prowess with the mountain bike, teaching the kids, and, and you've got these camps going, which I think is great. You're working with any kids anywhere from 10 to 16, is it? Really? From, I do an Otis Guy mountain bike camp. I've been doing it for uh, my sixth year. I have kids from age 7 to 13. Mm -hmm. It's just so much fun. First, you're not their parents, so they actually listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> strictly road biking and I wasn't very experienced and after the first day going like 34 miles my knees were killing me mm -hmm. and, and so the, the, the guy who was kind of heading it up he said well let me see you sitting on this thing and he goes well here's your problem your seat's too low mm -hmm. so he yeah. raised the seat up and and after that I had no problem oh yeah no at all we, and we make sure the kids are fed every you know, every the first morning we go to all the bikes and make, sure, make sure they're all safe and it's more than just results with this learning the trails well I've got like seven other eight-year-old kids then after a week of camp, they're taking their parents for like a two-hour mountain bike ride because now they know all the routes around the trail. Wow, that is so, so cool. It's really fun on how the youth leaders go, I'll be doing another camp, we'll see this parent coming back and like, well, that just took me for a two-hour mountain bike ride, and here's this little guy, it's like, I can hear your voice, so okay, be careful here, and like, watch this, this rock here, you know, so it's really, really fun. Well, I'll tell you what, if it's all downhill, I'll join them. Hey, always uphill. Always uphill. the top of 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 the top uh, hikers, and most of the time, 95% of the time, the guys that are riding the bikes or the gals are going to, you know, very cordial. Yeah, they're yeah. going to be cordial, they're going to slow down, but unfortunately there's there's the odd guy, you know, young guy who's got the testosterone raging, and he, he's flying down the, the track, you know, 25 miles an hour, and you better move out of his way. And those are the people, unfortunately, you get these older folks, like our, myself, or older, that are hiking, they freak, oh my god, here comes one of them. So you have to kind of, uh, you have to deal with those people sometimes, don't you? Yes, and it's tough because there's usually like 1% of hikers that are idiots, 1% of oh, people yeah. that are idiots, 1% of bicyclists that are idiots. Yeah. You know, so, in fact, even with Great Mountain Biking, Great Mountain Biking started a thing called Spirit of Howdy. And what Spirit of Howdy is that whenever you see somebody on the trailer out, say howdy to them. And that's actually been adopted by, by actually by all the uh, mountain bike races. You know, it's interesting. We I was just on a hike uh, with uh, some friends, and uh, it, I was wondering why everybody was so friendly. 
It's all because of that. That, that was that's what you're, you're talking about the mountain bikers yeah, and the hikers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everybody, every time you pass somebody, we've got forever built reasonable. The person who built the first hill, modern mountain bike, we always said hi. We yeah. For hill, you like say hi hill. Say hi. Look where you are. We're all enjoying this beautiful place. And I think because we did that hill, it's just making the relationship so much better. It, it does. It's interesting. I mean, I, I ran I ran a motorcycle, and every time you see another motorcyclist, you know, you just kind of wave to them and that sort of thing. Tell you what, uh, Otis, stay with us uh, two minutes. We're just going to a quick commercial break here. Um, okay, so the theme is just miscellaneous trivia. Now, I don't know if this is correct. Okay. <laughs> you, have to, right. you just have to trust me on it. Who has played the most consecutive NFL games? Ooh, good question. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, email edward at sportsecon101.com to answer that question. Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. We will be right back. All right. All right. So one more segment on this. Thanks for hanging yeah, in there. Yeah, I appreciate it. The business as far as your question about your mountain bike and everything else. You know, yeah. For Fairfax and different places, we talk about North Star mountain bike has, has made economy now. Let, let's do that. Yeah, let's that, get that's into good. Because that. like we can talk about the business aspect. Like it, it could be a big part of the economy if people would let us. Yeah, okay. Know, and if, you know, if you're, you're, you're in this business, by making things very difficult, not getting along, it's, it's making it harder better for you economically to get along and find a way to get along. No question. No okay, question. yeah, let's get into the business aspect. Of, that's, a, that's a good one. It, yeah, okay. it relates to what we're talking about here. Uh, right. would, it be, would it be Matthew's uh, uh, father that might have that? He has, he has a long street. Now, who was that again? Uh, uh, Clay Matthews' father was a, was a Bruce Matthews. Oh, Bruce Matthews. Yeah, that's a good one. A good, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah, yeah you, you don't have to answer that on the air. Who was that? The Port of Farm, I thought, had a quarterback. Yeah, he did. Okay, okay, ready? Sure. We'll, we'll let you answer on the air. We'll see if you're right. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Ooh, take, take it a risk here. Here we go. Here we go. All right, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. One more time, Edward Brown here along with Bruce McGowan. And when we get to the second commercial, or, yeah, let's see here. The second commercial break trivia question, it was, who has played the most consecutive NFL games? Guy, what's the answer? No, I mean, Otis, what's the answer? Well, I, I was one for uh, Clay Matthews' father, I, I believe his father, Bruce Matthews, might be uh, a lineman that might be the one that might have it. I always think. And, and, and the answer is, eh. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to say George Blanda. Eh. No? How about uh, Brett Favre? No, Jim Marshall. Jim Marshall? Jim Marshall, Jim Marshall. Oh, yeah. I said maybe he's trying to make up for wow. running the wrong way. You know, interesting thing about Jim Marshall, I believe it was, actually it was his teammate Carl Eller became a, uh, a judge. Uh, no, no, no. Um, not uh, Carl, no. Uh, Alan Page. Alan Page, right. Yeah, Alan Brady. Yes, yeah. very good. Yeah, thank you for your stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. Alan Page, you're right. And you'd never uh, you'd never know he was a football player if you saw him because he's so lean now that he was a, a yeah. big dude back oh, in the day. I love that guy. Yeah. Love him. But Bruce Matthews, that Otis was mentioning, that, that guy played it on the offensive line until he was in his 40s. That's amazing. I think about 40, 41 when he retired. I saw him play in the Super Bowl, the last Super Bowl I covered, uh, Tennessee versus the uh, – Rams when Kurt Warner and, and the St. Louis Rams won their only Super Bowl back yeah. in nineteen. Well, actually, it was 2000. in two thousand after the nineteen ninety nine season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're good. So uh, we have uh, on the phone here Otis Guy, pioneer of mountain biking, and uh, Otis. Want to ask you about the business aspect? Which first thing I was thinking of is you know I don't know when this started, but a lot of these ski resorts, as uh, Bruce was mentioning, yeah, North Star yeah, up, in, like, up like, in North Tahoe. I mean, I mean, when it's snowing, it's great for skiing. But what do they do in the summertime? Well. Turns out some of them, I guess, turn into uh, mountain biking, don't they? Absolutely. In fact, a lot of the races, I, I did the Northern National Circuit for years. I had a race recently, and a lot of the races were at ski resorts. Well, it's a way that you can utilize the ski resorts better, but now they've got that they're far better, like a North Star, where they're building the tracks for the mountain bikers, where there's jumps, where there's everything else. And you're starting to see that it'll get better now. I'll bet there's a lake, Lake Stafford, which is a, a lake up in Nevada, California. North of San Rafael, north of San Francisco, they're, they're about to have a bike park open up in the next few weeks. That will have a course for mountain bikes to ride. It'll have like little jump courses. It'll have a pump track where people can go. So you're really starting to see that that part of with us opening the museum in Fairfax is to really have people understand that you know, cycling, road cycling also, and mountain biking can really make an impact in the community. There's a place called Crystal House. You know, which is like a beer and brats place in downtown Fairfax, but exclusively serve cyclists. What you're seeing these different communities, especially in Europe, that have really embraced the mountain bike and embraced road cycling, 
because they know it makes a difference for their communities and for their economies. And Fairfax is definitely being touched by that. And Miranda, you see how many people you see riding across the bridge on their bikes? Oh my gosh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask an oddball question. Um, you know, with Lance Armstrong and, and all the PEDs, are they starting to do that with mountain bikers too? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, Has I'm there been a steroid a scandal in mountain bikers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Too. Otis Guy is our guest. He's a, a mountain biking pioneer. And Otis, when you talk about mountain biking, a lot of people say, oh, it's the, the Gen Xers that are doing it. And it's true. There are a lot of young people doing it. But, you know, you and I are the same age. We're in our early 60s, late 50s. And I, I am just amazed at how many people that are our age or older that are mountain biking. There's a guy, for instance, uh, who, who uh, about mountain bikes the Tam Rancho Trail in, in our hometown of Fairfax. And I see him all the time. I can't remember the fellow's name. He was a uh, pro. Yeah, Jim. He's like in his. Oh, yeah, Jim. Jim. Yeah. Got to be. Got to be seventy. Yeah, seventy-five, eighty years old. He's he's in great shape, and he's the guy that's a great attitude. So it's a sport for everybody. You don't have to be young. It helps, but I mean, you don't have to be, uh, you know, sixteen or, or twenty-six or thirty-six. You can be sixty-six and doing this thing. It's well, the sport is a very. It's always good to take sport to your life. You know, something you know, cycling doesn't break you down. Now, what do you think about those hybrid bikes? I mean, like I've got one that I can go on road or mountain biking, and obviously I know it's going to be it's not going to be as good as your typical mountain biker. Uh, you know, if we went head to head. But what do you think about bikes like that? I think those bikes are fantastic. Okay. That's something you can kind of use for everything. It's a great transport bike. Um, anything for me to get people on bicycles. Part of the reason uh, Joe Breeze and I really embrace these bikes when we were in the bicycle. Like so in, in the bicycle forever, what kind of you know, change difference are like what was there and mountain biking? Every kind of one point in their life, they rode off off road. Like, so when it was the 20s, I mean, the original bikes were all off road. The difference was we were part of the industry. So we saw these bikes as an opportunity for people to ride, for people to enjoy the, the area. So it's very fun to see how they've expanded. And that's also expanded, as, as Bruce was talking about. Older people don't ride it because there's better suspension, mm -hmm. there's yeah. bigger wheels, there's better tires. So the equipment is upgraded so much. I mean, when we were growing up, kids' bikes were relatively speaking the kind of pieces of crap. You were not if you had a geared bike, you were lucky the bikes worked very well, and the gears didn't work very well. Yeah. Because America came into cycling, and, and that you know, that we have so many people that live here that started it, embracing it so back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even still now. Company started making better parts. So even though you, know, you get a bike for your you know, six-year-old son, it might be heavy, but it works. It's yeah. safe. Well, I, I gotta say, like, like, ride. like yeah. I'm, I'm not a big cyclist, um, but I did get you know uh, one of those hybrid ones, and I love it because it's so comfortable mm. and it's amazing. Because I've had you know a bunch of bikes over the years, and you know being in first gear going uphill, it's amazing how easy it is. But I, I yeah. kind of feel like, you know, the, you know, daisy, daisy, giving your answer to, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of like an old fashioned type of type of thing. Cause obviously if you, you look at it and you go, that kind of looks like a sissy bike, but it is so comfortable. And with me and my back, I'm able to, you know, ride for quite a long time. And that's it. That's what it's, it's all about, you know, it's all about what works for people and, and all that getting better. Now you're even starting to see electric bikes getting a little bit of old. People that are getting older, you know, by their friends now, they're starting to have, you know, pedal actually activated. 
integrated electric transport, Whoa. or you can put transport. And you're seeing the industry, there's, and that's been a very good controversy, you're seeing the industry change so many different ways. But in the end, it's more about improving stuff, improving infrastructure, having you know, have the tone and standard tone that goes to large for ferries. You have to light like paths, all that that you get people out of cars and on bicycles. That's the, that's the book. It's the most efficient form of transportation anywhere. No like, question. Yeah. No question. Well, the only thing more fun than mountain biking might be surfing. I always, <laughs> Otis and I have that. Uh, we're, we're kindred spirits in that regard. I mean, I'm always checking with Otis, and he, he said, I just had a great session out at Fort Cronkite or at Ocean Beach. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, that's one thing about Northern California. There's so many things to do. But, uh, man, I, I, you, you've been in, active ever since you were a kid, I, I would imagine, Otis. Were you one of those kids that was climbing trees when you were old enough to walk? Well, for me, for a big part for me was cycling. Was you know when I was five years old, my mom got my first bicycle. Um, she had, had training wheels on. I had the training wheels taken off. My dad comes. He worked at Hamilton Air Force Base. He come home from work, the old '57 bus, and he followed me over to Coleman School, the local elementary school, back and forth until he felt like I was okay on the bike. And once at five and a half years old, I was riding my bike in downtown Santa Fe and riding all over the place. So for me, bicycle is a passport to freedom. Wow. And, and, and that rang very yeah. true in that kind of life and a, a cycling life would be good. It's something that's so much fun, but also it, it is a passport to keep you active and independent. Yeah, I, 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 grew up, I, I grew up the same way because you know we weren't old enough to drive a car, but yet our parents were okay. They felt safe enough that you could go out on the street. Um, you know, back then we didn't, we didn't even wear helmets, right? But I, I still wear those things. Yeah, I still remember yeah. the training wheels coming off. What, what I know, what amazes me though nowadays is you see so many mountain bikers. I mean, they got the helmets, they got the mouthpiece, they got the the headgear, the the the, 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 pad, the pads on the elbows. I up up at the North Star recently, Otis. I was up there in, in near Lake Tahoe recently, and there were a couple of young guys who were wearing these uh, chest protectors that looked like I guess because when they take a, a header off the bike. You know, you can really get scraped up pretty good, and this kind of protects you uh, from uh, too much abrasion when you hit the ground, I guess. Well, also, unfortunately, there was a, a man that just died in Crest Union on Saturday. Really? He used to just call the Dura race, the Enduro race. Uh -huh. so for sure, like, you'll, you know, we'll push uphill and get uphill, and they'll start times you on different downhills. Mm. He was stuck Crest Union. He had one voice common to the chest. You know, so that was the autopsy. I think it's called pericardial promenade. Um, also, that's a paramedic. They had been the cause where your, your, your heart is swelled up, the, the, the contagion of your heart is swelled up, and doesn't allow your heart to beat. Wow. And, wait, uh, wait, so only did... a like, 34 year old man wow. passed away, and this was the first, like, to me, the first death that I know of in a neuro race. Wow. And yeah. it's very, very, you know, very, very sad, but that's. You know. So, o Otis, was it because of being a heart attack, or did he actually fall no, off one, and hit something? So he took a he took a header off the bike, yeah. And he caught a pedal and he went down hard on his chest. Well, actually, mm. looked like wow. relatively weak. He suffered no head injury, brain wasn't anything like that, but he did suffer the blood force blood force trauma of the chest for me going on car accidents. That's when we're having somebody die the steering wheel hit their chest. Mm. You just get so hard it damages their heart and that can kill them. Well, there's no question that it looked like that's what happened this morning. Sure, I was going to say every every sport has its. Uh, has its dangers, its built-in dangers. I mean, we talk about surfing, and you can get uh, buried, uh, you know, on the inside by by big waves, or pulled out and, and get a uh, cramp and drown. So don't forget the sharks. Yeah, don't forget the sharks. Well, yeah, they're, they're so few. Yeah. I tell you, if the sharks wanted to get you, they would. Right? They, they got plenty to eat out there. So uh, I always kid with everybody. I always tell the, the surfers I, when I swim up to them because I'm always body surfing. I say, don't worry about the the sharks. If there's any around, I'm spamming the wetsuit. You know. <laughs> but you know, like any sport, does things do happen in competition? Like you were you guys down in uh, Laguna Seca that died in the yeah. uh, superbike race. That's right. Wow. So I mean, th things do happen, but you know, relatively, it's, it's a very big sport. But like Norstar, when they're going off jumps, you want to be armored up. You end up places like that. Absolutely. Most people are not riding their own. Like they're actually trying to do special mountain bikes that are meant you know to withstand like your taking a 15 foot jump, and having enough suspension to. to uh, that. So that's more yeah. like kind of like the downhill skiing. Yeah. You know, you're having like you know, getting Franz Klammer bikes instead of Franz Klammer skis. Hey, uh, Otis, we're going to have to uh, cut to our last commercial break here. Um, you want to give out any websites? Uh, website would be uh, www.mbcbhof.org. That's for Brit Museum of Bikes with Hall of Fame. And that's for, you know, please go there. In fact, we're now having voting for the, uh, for the class of. Thousand fifteen, the Mountain Bike Hall of 
of Fame. And there's you know, six candidates that are up. Your business number, this is worldwide. So you have candidates from uh, down under, from Europe, from Canada, from the U.S. And then from my ideal Mount Mike Camp, uh, you can go to skymountmikecamp.com and there are some built bicycle trails. Go to skycycles.com. Great. Oh, Otis, thank you so much for joining us today on Sporting Con 101. Fun for time and very nice meeting you. Okay. All right, Otis. Take care, buddy. That Otis is a great guy. You know, I, we didn't mention this. Otis made a living for years as a fireman. He's retired now. Uh, you have to retire, I think, at 57 or 58. But he was a terrific uh, fireman for many years. In, in Love having him on the show. Yeah, yeah, great guy. Okay, quickly, last commercial break. Uh, trivia question. Which team was the lowest seed to win an NBA championship? Ooh, good All right. one. Yeah. With us, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. We'll be back with some closing comments. Okay, good. Okay, he's a very nice yeah, guy. Yeah, he is a good guy. Right? Yeah, just kind of a specialty sport. Yeah, you know, no, I mean, it's, it's listen, we get a lot of, you know, baseball, football, yeah. football, so it's kind of neat. And, yeah. and it was interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, he's good. I, I always am inspired by this because he's a couple years younger than me, but that guy is in such good shape. He's 6'6", uh, six, six, weighs about 190. And oh, he's just right. all gristle. You know, he's just built like a, like he was, you know, chopped out of a, you know, just a real slender, healthy, positive guy, always Always that's, upbeat, that's always happy. Good. That's what he sounds like. Yeah, he's a great guy. And he's got two kids. I guess they're teenagers now. Um, he's got a daughter who's who's got to be in her. I got to be close to thirty now. Yeah, yeah. he's been married a couple times. Oh, okay. yeah. Not like you and me, the old, the old <laughs> one. Uh, the once, once around. Yeah, my wife's working up on number twenty here in this uh, right. couple weeks. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, she's doing okay. The cancer is in a holding pattern right now, so we're. Yeah. Joy why you can't. Yeah, that's what that's the name of the game. All right, some closing comments here. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Like last time for today, Edward Brown here along with Bruce McGowan. When we cut to our last commercial break, we ask this trivia question. Which team was the lowest seed to win an NBA championship? You know, I, I'm going to take a wild stab. I think in the late 60s when the Celtics, Bill Russell, was still around, and it was in the last couple of years, I believe they were – a fourth seed and won it one year, but I, I may be wrong. You know what? I don't know which number seed it was. I just know the answer. Okay. Houston Rockets. Houston Rockets. When they won, they were the lowest. So seed. in the mid in the uh, mid nineteen nineties, yeah. between the, they were they bridged Michael Jordan. They had won three in the early nineties, three in the late nineties, and they were in the middle. Yeah, it was Elijah, Elijah one. Elijah one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember who they beat. I just, I, <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't. It's funny, I can remember who the Celtics beat, but I can't remember. And that was 40, 50 years ago. You know? So it just shows you. Yeah, the old short term. Yeah, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right, so uh, let's see. Next week, uh, it's just going to be you and me. Yeah, we'll have some fun. We'll have some fun talking a little football, baseball, and yeah. any other sports stuff that comes yeah. up. So here's our thoughts for the day. Casey Stengel said, most games are lost, not won. And Reggie Jackson said, Fans don't boo nobodies. That's, that's true. That's true, yeah. Right? you got to be somebody to be booed. Exactly. Right? You, you do. Can you imagine being some guy who comes up and, and just, you don't hear anything from the fans? Oh, no, that's got to no hurt. No cheers, no boos. It's like no you're irrelevant. You're, you're just exactly. a nobody. Yeah, no. yeah that's, that's a good, good point by Reggie. All right. And, uh, and he was booed a lot. Oh, was, was he, he ever? cheered a lot, too. But uh, uh, I'll tell you a Reggie story in our next show. It's our next show? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I want to hear a Reggie story. Yeah. All right, so that's why you're going to have to tune in to next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and a Reggie story. And giving <laughs> away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. Well, we'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. Okay, All right. okay. Show number one. Show number one is in the books. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Well, let's talk about the 49ers.